Good morning, church family. Welcome to worshiping with us here at First Gilbert. Thank you for joining us in person and also for those who are joining us online. Today we continue our sermon series called A Living Hope. And Pastor Rick is preaching on like living stones this morning. It is Communion Sunday. For those that are joining us at home, please take a couple seconds and prepare your communion table so you can participate with us today. Please remember to fill out your yellow attendance card. It lets us know that you are here. And it also is an opportunity to share any prayer requests that you might have. There is also a white card for the volunteering. If you have questions about any of our ministries or would like to help or participate in one, please fill out that card. Both cards can be put in the offering baskets that are placed around the sanctuary. We just have a few announcements this morning. First one is the youth stock sale is going on today. They are out on the patio. They can answer any questions you may have about their upcoming mission trip, but it is a way to invest on the experience that they are gonna have in Northern Arizona this summer. If you have any questions, you can contact Shayla at youthministry at gilbertumc.org. Our next announcement this morning is that the blood drive is going on in the activity center. It started this morning and they do have a few remaining spots available, so walk-ins are welcome. Our next announcement is we continue to need volunteers for Vacation Bible School. And it is June 5th to June 9th. It is coming up in less than a month. The theme this year is Ready, Set, Move. We are looking for volunteers to help the week of, but if you stop by and visit with them out on the patio this morning, there is information on how you can donate or how you can help prior to Vacation Bible School to help them be prepared to provide this incredible ministry to the kids in our community. That is all our announcements for this morning. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. Please stand as you're able and join the call of worship. Once we were not a people. Once we ate food that did not satisfy. Taste and see that the Lord is good.
please join in the opening prayer. Merciful God, our refuge and our strength, train our hearts in the words of your Son. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Feed our souls with your spiritual milk. Build our very lives spiritual houses. Neither famine nor the storm and shake the foundation of our faith. In the name of the Master, brother, and the living stone, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This is one of my favorite times uh, during church is when we get to bring new people into the body of Christ. So I'm going to ask those that are joining our congregation to come, uh, come up here and be with me. And Adriana at this time. And don't be nervous. I realize I look at them every week and they are scary to a certain extent, but that's okay. We'll get over that. So I'm going to start real quickly, 
with uh, just kind of introductions and, and go around and I get this from what they tell me and I have come to know them a little bit. This is uh, a Amy Jo or AJ Harris and she's, uh, she's been a lifelong Methodist. She said uh, she, she's transferring her membership from Belgrade UMC in uh, Belgrade, Nebraska. And uh, she works for uh, uh, in research and development at a med tech company, which is B&D. They, they make manufacture uh, medical supplies, uh, all kinds of stuff. And she gets to test it before it goes inside your body to make sure that it actually works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see? There you go. Anyway, uh, she, you know, as far as what she says she does for fun, and uh, this is kind of what's neat is because she hit me on three different levels because she says she loves motorcycles, fishing, and hunting. And so, you know, we, we're, we're kind of squared away on that one. So if you find us chatting before church, that's usually we're talking about one of those three subjects. So that's it. And she found our way to, uh, to First UMC and Gilbert through a common friend. Thank you very much, Tina Reese. <laughs> yes. Next we have Michael Orr. And you guys should have just come up here and been with us. <laughs> uh, he lives in Mesa, retired software engineer from, uh, uh, through Boeing and the military. Uh, he worked uh, on helicopter systems. He comes to us from a Lutheran background, uh, the faith that he was baptized into. His hobbies include camping, and he loves to walk and also volunteering. Again, we thank, can thank uh, Phil and Tina mostly Phil, for uh, sending, getting them uh, into our church. So again, thank you for the Reese family. And we have next, we have Kyle McKenzie, uh, Kyle and McKenzie, um, Kyle, McKenzie Greer and Kyle Marshall. They, they uh, have been coming to us for a while, and they've especially been an active part of our Wednesday night Bible study program, and it's been a joy to get to know them. And Kyle is just one of the most, comes in the first night, and he just starts sharing the things that he, that's on his mind and stuff about Scripture and whatever, and I'm thinking, this guy's pretty smart. <laughs> So then they took a break, and one of them come in time. Now, now she's there, so we get both of them at some different times or another. But anyway, Kyle uh, McKenzie, uh, uh, they both live in Tempe. They've been married three years, and there's actually three of them up here this morning. You can't see one of them. <laughs> Said this, she's expecting her first, their first child later this fall. She did say that I could share it's a boy. <laughs> also, uh, whatever. So she's, uh, <laughs> McKenzie was raised in a Methodist church, uh, so in their search for a local Methodist church, that was pretty much, she found us online and they thought they'd give us a try and they found a church family here. She's a uh, pediatric speech language pathologist and is employed by Horizon Pediatric Therapy. Incorporated. Her hobbies include hiking, nature, singing, drawing, art, working with kids, family, and community. <laughs> and she's an art lover. So Kyle uh, listens to his wife's good judgment. <laughs> well, the reason I say that is because the Methodist tradition, she was Methodist, and so she said, let's go try the Methodist church. And so they said, yeah. So that's what it meant by that. Just, you listen to it, so. um, anyway, Kyle works for the city of Phoenix. He's employed as a transit, uh, transit planner, data analyst. Hobbies include biking, coffee shops. We're right at, squared up with that one, both of those. Philosophy, writing. He has an interest in learning, beauty, family, community, cooking. And both of them are regular, uh, like I said, attenders at our Wednesday evening class. And it's a joy to have them here. It's a joy to have all of, all of these people that are before you here this morning with us. So, a couple questions. The introduction is pretty straightforward. That in, uh, through baptism, the sacrament of baptism, we are incorporated into Christ's holy church. We're initiated into Christ's holy church. We're incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. And all of this is a God, God's gift offered to us without price. And through confirmation and the reaffirmation of faith, we renew our covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. 
And so I have a couple questions for you on behalf of the whole church. I asked you, do you renounce your, the spiritual fo forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, respond, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, same response. I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened up to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, respond, I do. And according to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? If so, respond, I will. And do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm your, both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and now include these people that are here before you this morning in your care? Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Now to all of you, I say remember your baptism and be thankful and may the Lord, the Holy Spirit work within you that haven't become disciples of Jesus Christ through water and the Spirit, that you always may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. As members of Christ's Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, respond, I will. And as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministry by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so respond, I will. Amen. Members of the household of God, I commend to you all these people, Amy Jo, Michael, Mackenzie, and Kyle, to you for your loving care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and project, perfect them in love. I'm absolutely sure they meant that. <laughs> the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you, strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may always live in peace and grace. Amen. Amen. Yay! <laughs> yes, welcome.
The scripture reading is from the first letter of Peter, chapter 2. Like newborn infants, long for the pure, spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, through rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in the scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become a very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobeyed the word, as they were destined to. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may be proclaim the mighty acts of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of God for the people of God. So as was mentioned earlier, we'll continue with the series on it being a living hope. We'd like to welcome each person that's here this morning into our fellowship and into this congregation and into this space this morning. The church is not complete unless you're here. And I mean that in the, in the, the, the most literal interpretation of that. It needs, it needs the body of Christ assembled to, to operate more than just about anything else. And that's what the message is for this week. It's about uh, who you are and, and uh, why we've passed out the Legos this morning for you to build something at the end of the service. We've got our boards out there, and when you go, you, you're going to give me my Legos back, but you're going to actually put them out there and create something or continue to create what's been started by the 830 service. So give that some thought about what piece you are in, in the church. So, um, again, welcome to, uh, to you that are here this morning. Welcome to our online folks as well. And if you've got Legos in your closet, you can get those out and, and, and be thinking about that same thing. Have you ever heard the expression um, that it's an acquired taste? And have you ever uttered these words yourself to someone? Maybe, maybe when you were sitting at a table with them at a restaurant and you was trying to get them to try something different rather than the steak and potatoes or something that was, they always eat. And, and so you suggest something that you've tried that you really, really like and you, ask, you tell them, you ought to give this a try. Uh, you'll, you, you know, you'll like it. And then after they do, they order it off the menu and they come and it's there and they take the first bite of it, you know, and then they look at you, you know, like you got two heads or and they wrinkle their nose at you and, and you know, and it, it, it doesn't go well. And I guess that what I'm thinking about is, uh, you know, something like you, you, you suggested oysters on the half shell, or maybe even uh, something different, some escargot, something exotic, or even blue cheese crumbles on a salad, you know. I won't even try those. I, I did once, that's it. But they say, you know, that's, that's an acquired taste. Um, but then when, after, after you ex have that experience, you know, the person looks at you, you know, that, 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 and gives you this look, and, uh, and, and you say something very clever. Well, I guess it's like fine wine. It, it's an acquired taste. And they say, yeah. The underlying meaning to that message is, is good grief, friend. When are your taste buds going to grow up? And if you're the one that's doing the taste testing, you're likely to say, I'll never eat that again. <laughs> never. This is not a taste I will ever acquire. An acquired taste is about what the, the message is today. It's not something that's applicable to just food alone, 
alone. Think about long distance running or head banging music. Both of these are acquired taste. And I'm sure you can think of your own examples. However, the epistle reminds us that we are spiritual infants who need to, uh, the nurture of pure spiritual milk. If we're to grow like Christ into a royal priesthood, we must become like Christ. We must become living stones within the house of God. Yet God does not assure us of this safe journey, and this is why we need to develop this acquired taste for spiritual milk, which we are told is the Word of God. God's Word spoken through Christ will enable us to grow. When we first come to Christ through, receive, uh, through receiving His salvation, we are spiritual newborns. But we're not meant to stay that way. God's plan for us is to grow, and to grow strong in our faith, and become mature in our understanding of God's Word and God's will for our lives. So how does this happen? Well, first of all, you have to be, you have to be fully convinced that spiritual growth is God's plan for you. We must take steps to grow strong in knowledge of His truth. That pure spiritual milk of God's Word should be part of our daily diet. Just like our physical bodies, we sometimes neglect the things that uh, things necessary to have a healthy spiritual life. And the bottom line is that daily it's a good idea to feed our spirit. Many parents enjoy tracking their child's growth by making pencil marks on the wall or scratch marks on the doorpost of the entryway into the bedroom. It can be fun to look at when the visual record of progress and marvel how much our child has grown. We know that many factors affect our physical, mental, and emotional development. Our hereditary and DNA package play an integral part, but we all, we have a role as well. We can nurture growth or we can hamper it. And the same is true in the spiritual realm. We can cooperate with the Holy Spirit and grow in grace or we can hinder the process. In 1 Peter 2.2, the apostle tells us to crave that spirit the spiritual, pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. The Greek text literally says that we will grow into our salvation. The shape of that growth in its final form has already been determined for us. We're growing into the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Growing into the likeness of the fullness of Christ. Just think about that for a second. The primary means that God uses to nurture our growth is the Word of God. Peter describes the Word of God as pure spiritual milk that we should crave. This command is a little surprising. It implies that we have a responsibility to be disciplined in our intake and cultivate our hunger. To crave is to have a powerful desire for something. I suspect there are a few people here who do not there are, there are few people here who do not, at least occasionally, have cravings for something. A craving is often your body's way of telling you that you need something, kind of like chocolate at the end of Lent. Well, you almost need it, you know, but you still crave it nonetheless. And that's the, the example that Peter uses here, is what he says is craving like a newborn craves milk. The newborn desperately needs milk and cannot survive without it. What Peter is saying to his readers and hearers is to develop a taste for God's Word. Unfortunately, the majority of folks in the surrounding area where Peter's church was believed that this spiritual milk, the Word of Christ, was detrimental to their health. So just like the folks during our own Prohibition area, era, they wanted to make it difficult for anyone to partake to partake in this metaphorical beverage, so they ostracized and persecuted these fledgling, fledgling Christians. Such was the source of the persecution that befell Peter's audience. Still, he tells them to crave this drink. In the natural realm, eating and exercise go together. Food provides fuel for growth and activity, and the same holds true in the spiritual realm. Spiritual development comes when we combine 
spiritual nourishment with obedience. But ultimately, however, it is God who makes us grow. God has given God's word and provided for those who teach it. The Holy Spirit grants us understanding and empowers us to obey. God is the source of our spiritual life and the secret behind our spiritual growth. But the question posed to us today is what are we growing into? Verse 2, 3 says that you're growing into your salvation by consuming the spiritual milk, the Word of God. Like a living stone, let yourself be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. For centuries, the, the ancient temple of Jerusalem formed the center of religion of ancient Israel. An impressive set of buildings set on the Temple Mount of Zion. It was seen as the site of God's presence, where priests of the lineage of Aaron brought offerings to God in the name of the people. These animal and grain offerings, offerings expressed believers' desire to enter into a fellowship with their Lord, expressing their gratefulness and giving back to God something of what God had given to them. As an early Christian leader writing to the believers of non-Jewish origin, like most of us, Peter borrowed from these elements from the religion of old, while at the same time transforming them. He changed them. He made use of them to explain to his hearers their new identity as disciples of Jesus Christ. Taking up the words spoken by the prophet Hosea centuries earlier to express God's forgiveness of his unfaithful people, the apostle affirms that his hearings now are now part of the people of God, chosen to be primary witnesses to his love in the world, not because of their merits, but solely due to God's compassion, shown in tangible fashion by the coming of Christ for all. And therefore, Christians, <clears throat> for Christians, the location of the divine presence is not a geographical location or a building but human beings. Our church is not a building. It's a people. And Christ is our cornerstone. His disciples are the living stones who cluster around him to form the house of God. At the same time, they are compared to the priests who serve in this new temple, who served in the temple. In other words, it is by the life of the Christian community when it remains faithful to its founder that the world will discover the true identity of God and commit to a growing relationship. That's why it's so important for Christians to live in such a way that they reveal the authentic image of their invisible God by their mutual love for all. This growth and spiritual development comes when we combine spiritual nourishment with obedience. Ultimately, however, it is God who makes us grow. And again, we ask, grow into what? Peter seems intent on transforming his threatened audience, not simply by telling them what to do, but by reshaping their identity in line with their Lord and their new heritage. And it begins with a powerful image of stones being built into God's temple. In this word picture, Jesus is the living stone whom the believers have embraced and in whom they have found their hope. Jesus is also the cornerstone rejected by people of, but of greatest value to God. The connecting point for Christian identity comes in verse 5. But you yourselves are being built like living stones into a spiritual temple. That's the way the CEB has it. The follower is being made into the image of the master. And the followers together are being built into God's temple to offer, offer up spiritual sacrifices. The image given is both complex and beautiful. But Peter's not finished yet with the metaphor. As believers are made in the image of their Lord, they also participate in the value God has placed on the cornerstone, Jesus. One of the striking features of 1 Peter is how often the Old Testament shows up in a letter that it's, by all accounts, written to Gentile believers in Jesus. So far, 
In this passage, we've heard at least four references to different Old Testament passages from Psalms and Isaiah. And in the concluding verses, our author draws from Exodus, Isaiah, and Hosea to ground the Gentile audience in the identity of Israel, his covenant people. Peter reports that those who had one time existed outside of God's covenant and now had been recipients of God's mercy, the Gentiles of Peter's audience have now been welcomed into God's family by the unfailing mercy of God. Even so, all of us, whether you're new to the faith or longtime believers, the people of our congregations, you should know that we need to be grounded in their identity in Christ in ongoing ways, that we are God's precious stones built upon that living cornerstone, Jesus. We are God's own possession, and we've been brought from darkness to light to offer spiritual sacrifices and proclaim God's act of mercy. The primary question that is raised today is, what is this church of Jesus Christ supposed to be? Are we simply in a church building that's become stiff and boring, weathered by years and near extinction? Or are we a building church with veins full of life and empowered goals of still striving to make disciples of Jesus Christ? The church that Jesus built was a living church, alive with living stones that were its building materials. Living stones that had at their cornerstone the very stone that the builders of the world had rejected. And though rejected by mortals, God previously chose this cornerstone so that it would become the foundation for the church, for this building right here on earth. Jesus had faith in his construct, construction ability. Though he had the whole world from which to choose, he selected very simple material. A few fishermen, a tax collector, and some others of seemingly simple means and position. There were no kings in his foundation. He didn't use any successful business personalities in his first floor. And he completed the, final, the first stage of his structure without the help of marketing or developers. Jesus just used stones, a variety of living stones that are gathered and assembled here today. He used stones that would weather the cause Stones that would not crumble under the weight that would be built upon them. The building material that Jesus chose was well suited for the building he intended to construct. For the church that Jesus was building was a living, breathing construction of dynamic proportions. One that would outlast the ancient structures of Jesus' time and one that still stands today. The church Jesus Christ was, was, would build was built of last in eternity. Still, we get hung up on the church building. Is it meeting our needs? Does it need to make major repairs rather than just continued maintenance? Should we add on or rebuild? Should we overhaul? Should we renovate? Should we modernize to fit the times? These are good questions. Since the church building is where the church is proper is fed, but we need to remember that the church is a tool. It is a building. The real church is its people. But we do need to teach and preach and receive the sacraments. But the true identity of the church is who is sitting next to you. That's who the church is and what the church is. Jesus is more concerned with building the church than the church building. If you build it, they will come. Ever since that line emerged from the movie Field of Dreams, we've been using it to describe everything from a shopping mall to a major league baseball stadium. But the truth remains, whether it's a church building or a baseball stadium, just building it isn't enough. It's how you build it. 
If you don't build the baseball team to go with the stadium, people will not come, or at least not for long. And if you build a fabulous church building, but do not build the church in proportion to it, you end up with a fabulous empty building. Sometimes people in the church want the benefit a church has to offer without sharing the responsibilities, though. We all want revival as long as someone else does the praying. We want more people in the pews as long as someone else does the inviting. We all want to see the church built up with more programs as long as someone else does the work. The moral of Second Peter is if you want to build a church, you're going to have to become part of the construction crew. Add your Lego to the project. That's the purpose of that. That's the illustration for today. As you leave today, add your Lego to the project. It started out there in the narthex by your 830 brothers and sisters. Add to it. Scripture says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. These are words of encouragement for the church today. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. For all the ways you bless us, we are grateful. On this day where we hear the words of the church, about the church, we think about it, what it means to be a church and church family and how to do church. And although the church building is evolving, the church itself has always been built by the people who go there. The church is the people who go there that are growing in grace and growing in mercy and growing in love for their brothers and sisters and for all creation. We thank you for the words of today. They take us back home. They remind us and ground us of who we are and whose we are. So we are thankful. God, as we commune with you at the table this morning, speak to us. Teach us about who we really are. Make us live into the identity that we have as a child of God. Yes, we're thankful for all the ways you bless us and care for us and love us, and we we don't even have to ask for that, and it happens. But we do want to, to get a greater understanding of why you love us so much. And I think it's because that we, you have created us to be yours in such a specific way. So bless us, we ask, and we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our invitation to offering this morning is to pray, to reflect, to think about means to provide that we were creating spiritual milk to feed ourselves, to feed our church, and to flow into our community. The baskets will not be passed within the pews this morning, but they are set at the front and the back of the church. You can always go online to gilbertumc.org where there is information to give online via text or mail. Thank you for your faithful giving to the ministries of First Gilbert. Jesus, the only one who could ever 
Join the offering prayer. God of overflowing abundance, you feed our spirits with spiritual milk and nourish our souls with heavenly food. You are our fortress and our rock when the snares of this world threaten to overwhelm us. In gratitude for your mercy and your many blessings, we offer you our gifts and our ministries that a wounded world might know your grace. Amen. You may be seated. Christ invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another, saying together, merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, proving God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Again, it's important for us to know that the United Methodist tradition that we have an open table. Everyone is welcome at this table. No one is to be turned away. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to God. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus who now reigns with you in glory and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with his death, Jesus took bread. 
And he gave thanks to you and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat this, all of you. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this as often as you would in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he again, he took the cup and gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you would in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this wine, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ's blood, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours now and forever, Almighty God. Amen. And now with the confidence of redeemed children of God, let us pray together the prayer Christ taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one loaf. The bread in which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. And ask those that are helping this morning to come forward this time. The table has been set. The invitation has been given. The presence of Christ awaits you here at the table. Come and commune. Be with our Lord. Come.
Please stand as you are able and join the prayer after communion. Okay, uh, eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit. Give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. a good day. It's been a good morning. New members, communion, doesn't get much better than that. As I was getting the service ready, the sermon ready for this week, Jan says, my wife, what are you preaching on? I said, that we're living stones. She said, I knew you was a hard head. <laughs> Is that what you're going to say? I said, I, I don't know. We'll find something to say. May the love of God, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit take you to places and people that need you people that need your word, your encouragement, people that need you to help them find their way into this body. Go in peace. God loves you more than you know. We'll see you next week. Shine upon